So welcome everybody. I'm uh, Kevin McGee. I've talked here before. I know at least a few people have seen me before. Today I'm doing something a little different. Rather than talking about shipwrecks and things like that, I'm going to talk about sharks. For those who don't know me, I'm a scuba diver, uh, local scuba diver. Dive a lot in the Great Lakes. I actually am a member of Clue, Cleveland Underwater Explorers. We actually find shipwrecks in Lake Erie and other places. But sharks are kind of a subject that everybody's fascinated about. And so I, I happen to talk about them. I'm going to give you a perspective on sharks that hopefully is a little different than what you see in Discovery Channel during Shark Week. Uh, a lot of people ask if I like watching it, and I, my answer is no. Um, I love sharks, but I don't like the way Discovery Channel does it. You'll see why in a minute. I have some things to correct on what they do. Okay, so sharks. Here's some sharks here. And when I say sharks, what do people think of? What's the first thing that pops to your mind? Da dum, da dum, dum 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 dum. Uh, Jaws, of course. I'm sure everybody here has seen that movie. It's rare not to see, find somebody that has not seen that movie. And it's an incredible movie. I actually saw it a few years ago, and it's still just as scary today as it was back then. Even though the effects are rather cheesy, they're still real, it's still a gripping story. Unfortunately, Jaws made sharks the enemy. If people didn't like sharks before, they certainly didn't like sharks after Jaws. Uh, it was so scary, people would even go into swimming pools after that movie came out. And the word that you often get associated with sharks from that movie is man killer. I mean, the killer shark that goes around killing everybody. And I shouldn't say man killer. I mean, that's obviously not a man up there. That was the first victim in the film. But nevertheless, that's kind of where sharks got really a lot of coverage and a lot of bad reputation. Uh, in fact, Peter eventually said if he was to do it over again, he would have never written that novel. He, he, he's actually uh, very much for shark conservation now. And, and really regrets having written the book. And here's another movie, still. Um, one of the things that came out of the movie, people thought sharks as relentless. I mean, here you can see he's just chomping away at the orca, the boat there, trying to get to the people. This is Bruce, by the way. That's the name of the mechanical shark. They had three of them. Most of the time, neither of the three of them worked. And that's actually why the movie didn't show a lot of the shark at the first, because rarely was Bruce working. And so they had to go ahead and just do suspense instead and suggest the presence of the shark, which actually worked out even better for the movie. But you can see how relentless it is. Remember, we need a bigger boat? Well, here's, here's what happens to your bigger boat. And then on top of that, even after the boat sinks, there's poor Roar Scheider standing on the mast, and the shark's still trying to get him. Relentless. The shark just keeps coming. It will not stop. And of course, I think most people, we were just talking about this before, headlines. You see it all the time. Young surfer dies in shark attack. Bite victim said he feared for his life. Uh, nightmares haunt swimmer after a great white shark bites him off of California Beach. You see headlines like this all the time. Actually, you don't. You see it maybe once every, what, two, three months? Because it's actually a pretty rare event. If this happened every day, you would stop hearing about it. But it still sells. Uh, because it's a rare enough event, it's frightening, it grips people, and so people see headlines like this on a fairly regular basis, and it sticks. Uh, unprovoked is a word that you see used a lot in these sort of articles. Uh, the shark just came up and attacked with no reason whatsoever. Of course, oftentimes when you read into the details of what happened, the swimmer might have been a little bit at fault. First of all, the poor uh, surfers in California look an awful lot like seals to those great whites. Uh, and once they get a mouthful of fiberglass and neoprene, they realize they made a horrible mistake, but it's too late for the surfer. A lot of these are bites, too. And I'm going to get a little bit more into that later. But it's a bite. It's not killing. It's just a bite, or a bump, even. A shark attack is actually classified as anything that bumps, jostles, scrapes against, not necessarily even a bite. Because remember, they do have pretty rough skin. Even a, a shark going by rubbing against you can chafe you pretty bad. But this is kind of the, the news story that gets people really riled up about sharks. Another thing, almost always, in a lot of cases, especially in those Florida beaches, people were fishing right next to the swimmers. They were chumming the water. That's not uncommon. They're swimming next to a fishing pier. That's also a big part of the story. Ferocious. How many people have seen pictures like this? This is a great white shark leaping out of the water in South Africa. This, this gives the impression, again, you know, the shark is after people, after everything. You know, he's coming after the boat. Actually, do you know how they get this picture? They're yep, exactly. So these sharks come to South Africa because there are seal beaches nearby. 
Great whites are mostly marine mammals once they become full adults. They, that's their main course. And so seals are tasty. And what they do is, is they prowl at the 100 foot, devil, uh, 100 foot depth level off those seal beaches looking up for silhouettes. That's actually why they're white on bottom, gray on top. It's called counter shading. It's their camouflage because they operate from below. They're ambush feeders that hunt from below. They come up fast and hit from underneath. The way they get these pictures is they just tow a seal silhouette behind the boat, back and forth in front of the seal beaches, with cameras at the ready, hoping to get this the right shot. And every now and then you're lucky and you hit, the, the, the shark actually missed. Sometimes you'll see the seal silhouette like around here. This shark missed, it's probably right here in the foreground. Didn't quite hit it, but per, great picture. Unfortunately, um, you see this in a lot of things where they superimpose like a guy on a helicopter ladder right there and the shark's leaping out of the water to get him. Gives sharks this ferocious reputation that really isn't exactly earned. And of course, eating machines. I mean, the money shot, there it is. Teeth and everything, looking down the maw of the great white shark. Of course, to get this, what they do is they put some bait in the water, lure him up to the boat, and he's just trying to get a bite. And they just pull it right out of the water, and he keeps following, trying to get a bite, getting a little snack, and they snap the picture. Uh, they even pat him on the noses now, apparently. That's a thing. Um, but nevertheless, to get that picture actually takes a lot of effort, sometimes days and days, weeks of effort to get the shark to do this once or twice. But nevertheless, when you get a picture, boy, it sells. So I'm a diver, and this is how I see sharks usually. I see it in a very different way. So this is a nurse shark, and this was taken by Cindy off of Cozumel. Um, we were drift diving along the reef at about 60 foot depth, and per normal, a nurse shark came by, going the other way. The current was actually going this way, so we're drifting that way. Shark was swimming against the current, and they do that a lot better than we do. And the shark saw us, and he did this wide berth around us, and then kept on swimming. They're really evasive. Sharks really don't want to be near people, especially divers. We're kind of scary. We blow bubbles. We, we don't look like normal fish, and we're kind of clunky. And for whatever reason, most sharks want to have nothing to do with us. If you do get a good picture of a nurse shark, this is how you're going to get it. They're, they hide up under ledges. And so what you do is now you, it'll usually sit there until you get too close, then it'll take off and run. But they're really actually shy animals. They really don't want you around. And they'll hide from you long before they'll come after you. And nurse sharks are actually very cute. They're like little puppy dogs. You see little barbels there. They mostly eat crabs and things in the sand, flounders. That, that's actually a taste bud. They're tasting the sand, looking for prey that's hiding under the sand and rare. So one of the things is, is we rarely see sharks. We can go years without seeing a single shark, shark, year after year after year, diving for an entire week, 20 dives a week, no sharks. I'll get to that at the end of the program as to why that is, but they're actually really rare. We dove, this was taken in Guam, again by Cindy, and it was toward the middle end of the trip, and it was the first and only shark we saw. It's a black tip reef shark. You can see little black tips on it. And again, it was swimming off the reef, going the other way, and it was giving us a wide berth. So Cindy, of course, wanting to get a picture of the only shark we were gonna see on the trip, swam after it. Then she got close enough to get this fairly good one, and then it just kept on swimming and got further away. But they're really rare. Sharks are not all around. In fact, if we see a shark in a single week, that made the whole trip. Um, it's really, really exciting to see a shark, at least to us divers. And in fact, we will pay big bucks to go get guaranteed shark sightings, like this. So this is a thing. This is a shark dive, and people do this all over the world, the Bahamas, um, other places in the world, Caribbean, and divers will pay a lot of money for an opportunity to go swim with sharks. Does that guy look scared? All those sharks behind him? Nope, probably tuck his hands in, it might be mistaken for a fish, but um, what it is, is these are this is probably taken in the Bahamas based on the sharks. And what it is, is shark feeding is where an operation will go out and on a regular basis bring down a bucket of fish and uh, squid. Sharks love that. And in fact, you see this diver in the middle of this mass of sharks? He, they're not after him. They're after that bucket of chum. They, they smell that fish and the, the squid and that's, their, that's what they like to eat. And so they're all trying to get to that. Meanwhile, the divers are sitting around unmolested watching. They tell you to keep your hands and stuff in. Don't wiggle your fingers. Might be mistaken for something like a squid. But they'll swim around you, and this happens daily. There's dozens and dozens of dives like this every day all over the world. And I've only heard of like two instances of people being bit. 
One died, but he bled to death, unfortunately. But it's an incredibly rare thing, the fact that this happens daily all over the world and nobody gets hurt. Try that with lions and tigers and bears, oh my. Um, it probably wouldn't work out quite as well. I mean, even though they don't necessarily want people, they're still top predators. These are top predators, but this is actually not an unsafe thing to do for the most part. In fact, a lot of the divers actually fear the grouper more. The grouper are much more aggressive. And grouper have teeth too, by the way. Another word I'd use for sharks is beautiful. They are absolutely magnificent creatures. Uh, this looks like a little fighter jet. I mean, look at those, those spectral fins, the dorsal, very streamlined. This is a, a shark made for speed, perfectly designed for its environment to slice through the water. It's perfectly designed for what this animal does. Another one, the blue shark here, pretty shark. It's like a little missile, deep water shark, only found in miles deep water, far, far offshore, but just gorgeous. Uh, big eye, because they, they tend to see at night and they're also relatively deep sometimes, and so you need good vision. And they're really, really awesome creatures. So let's talk a little bit about their history. How did they get here? How long have sharks been here? How many people have heard that sharks are an ancient species? Okay, a couple. I don't think people fully appreciate how old these animals really are. Sharks as a, a species or a family have been around a lot longer than you think. So this is, you know, we're gonna do a little bit of geology here. Don't worry, it's short. This is called the geologic time scale. Almost everybody's probably seen it at one point or another in a museum or in high school or college or someplace like that. This is the Earth's history, starting 4.6 billion years ago when the Earth first formed after the collision that created our moon. And it goes all the way up to the present day at the top. 4.6 billion years crammed into here, but you notice we only really pay attention from 570 million years ago, let's call it half billion, on the way up. And the reason for that is that the first four billion years of Earth's existence had life, but it was single cell. And it doesn't preserve well. It's really hard to tell geologic ages based on fossils that almost never appear and a lot of the rock has been subducted and recycled into the mantle thanks to plate tectonics. And so the end result is, is there's stuff here, but most people don't start talking about anything until 570 million years ago. That's when the Cambrian explosion happened. That's when multicellular life just kind of came into being. There's actually indications it was around a little before that, but um, nevertheless, this is when life really took off. Oxygen levels climbed. The Earth does not, didn't always have oxygen, by the way. That was created by life itself. And from there on through the Cambrian, the Paleozoic, Mesoic, Cenozoic, all the way up, is pretty much what we call the history of the Earth. Sharks, here's the Cambrian explosion. Sharks are first in the fossil record right there in the Ordovician, the next, the next period. 450 million years ago is the first fossil evidence of sharks. That's a long time. They were in almost on the ground floor of multicellular life. They only missed it by one period. And they appeared in that second period, the Ordovician. To give you an idea how old that is, bony fish. When I say fish, you think of a bony fish. A bony fish looks like that, has a skeleton on the inside. Sharks aren't, they're fish, but they're not bony fish because they have a cartilage skeleton instead. The only bones in them are, in fact, are their teeth. And bony fish came 30 million years later and actually were not common until pretty much after uh, Pennsylvania and Mississippian. And the reason for that is this guy. Uh, local favorite, how many people recognize? Dunk Lostius. So, uh, if you go to the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, you see a lot of him. This is actually a Devonian period armored fish. It's a placoderm, um, and these were actually the majority of fish through pretty much the end of the Devonian. Uh, bony fish are around, but not in great numbers. This is the guy that ruled the seas up to the end of the Devonian. They no longer exist, they went extinct at that point. But sharks were around before this guy and before this guy. Sharks are right in at the base floor of what we would call fish. So what else could we peg them on? How early are sharks? So first of all, let's see what some sharks look like. Now this is Cladislac, another local celebrity, probably not as famous as Uncle Osteus, but we know a lot about Cladislac because some of the best fossils in the world came from Cleveland Shale, right here. We used, sharks used to swim in Cleveland, believe it or not, 450 million years ago, but nevertheless, they were swimming around, well, about 400 million years ago. So the reason we know so much about Cladislac is for whatever reason, it preserves really well in Cleveland Shale so well that even though there's no bones, we have perfect skeletons of them 
with stomach contents, organs, what they just ate, little fish scales, the teeth, the head, the fins, everything. That's how well preserved they are in Cleveland Shale. And that's why we know a lot about Cladoslack. So this is one of the very first sharks that kind of looks like a shark, uh, but it's a Cleveland celebrity, so I had to mention them. Other early sharks were kind of weird. Uh, this is uh, Helicoprion. And for a long time, all they found was this thing. And they wondered, what sort of animal does that go to? And there's a lot of speculation. They eventually got enough evidence to suggest, oh yeah, it's definitely shark teeth, so it's got to be a type of shark. But how the heck do you fit it? And they had all sorts of things. They had it coming off his nose. They had it coming down like this, like a droopy tongue, like a butterfly tongue. They eventually figured out it actually went in the jaw probably like this. It ate anamites, uh, hard-shelled nautilus-like creatures. And this is, this is his tools for doing that. And it's actually very much like sharks, but in a more surreal way. You know, sharks lose a lot of teeth, and they're always being replaced. This guy would grow teeth in a spiral production line, and they'd fall off the end, and they'd just keep growing out and being replaced that way. Weird way to do it, but nevertheless, early ancient shark. This is Stephylacanthus, and another weird shark. Not, it looks normal, and that's kind of speculative. Not a whole lot of evidence on what the body plan looked like. But they know not only did he have teeth, he had teeth on his top dorsal fin and on top of his head. They don't know why. Boy, we'd love to know why. But unfortunately, we don't. But it was good for something, because that guy actually stuck around for quite a per long period of time before finally going extinct. OK, so sharks are old. Sharks have been around a long time. How long? Before there was even life on land. That's how long. Sharks swimming around 450 million years ago. It was another 20 million years before the land was actually colonized for the first time by life. The life was completely barren when first shar sharks first started swimming in the oceans. When plants finally came out, now there's stuff living on at least the dry land, at least around the water in close areas. And the plants would go on for a while, and then eventually insects came out, about 400 million years later. By then, sharks have already been swimming for 50 million years. The first land animals did not make an appearance until really the end of the Devonian. Uh, it started in the Devonian toward the end of the Devonian in the Mississippian. And this is the guy that did it. It's called a tetrapod. This is the critter that first clawed out. This is the ancestor of uh, ant reptiles, amphibians, dinosaurs, mammals, birds, people. This is the guy that started it all. There's actually a whole group of them. Some succeeded, some didn't. But Sharks have already been swimming in the ocean for 100 million years at that point. So sharks are ancient. By the way, the first dinosaur, because everybody's got to talk about dinosaurs, right? Did not make an appearance until the start of the Triassic. Much, much later, 230 million years later, far after sharks have been around for a while. And the first mammal, by the way, came about the same time. So why did uh, dinosaurs take off? Well, you can argue why. But pretty much through the Jurassic Cretaceous, the flowering plants that appeared, by then, sharks had been around for a long time, until finally we made an appearance way back about eh, four million years ago, five million years ago. Um, meet, meet our distant ancestor. They call him Artie, Artipithecus ramatus, another uh, Cleveland Natural Mystery, History Museum find, by the way. And not at all what we expected. Definitely a tree climbing animal, but completely bipedal. Weird mixture of features. Why would you be a tree climber, yet completely bipedal? And they know he's bipedal. They have the knees, they have the hips. Uh, they have ankles and toes. These are tree climbing hands and toes and feet, but fully bipedal. But we're latecomers. We're, we, this is <laughs> way later. Um, sharks by then had been around for about 450 million years. OK, so I think that gives you an idea of how ancient sharks really are. There's another word I would use for sharks, survivors. So they've done something that is actually really unique. There's not many species that can claim this. They have survived every major extinction on the Earth that we know of. So the very first extinction happened at the end of the Ordovician. Uh, killed about 85% eh, of the sea life. They think it was glaciation that did it. Uh, the, the, uh, some ice ages came along. The Earth turned very cold. Second mass extinction happened at the end of the Devonian. That did in poor little uh, uh, armored fish. About 75% of life went extinct. Sharks went through that one, the big one. The Great Dying, as it's called, the Permian Extinction. 95, 96% of life on Earth went extinct at the end of the Permian. We still don't know why, by the way. It's highly debated. People have ideas, but there's no good answers. 
Sharks made it through the biggest mass extinction on this planet. And of course, the fourth mass extinction, only about 50%, only 50% this time, at the end of the Triassic. This is why dinosaurs took off. Kind of chance. Mammals and reptiles appeared at the same time, but the Triassic extinction, dinosaurs took off and rolled through the Jurassic and Cretaceous. And of course, we all know what happened at the end of the Cretaceous, right? The dinosaurs went extinct in the fifth mass extinction. Sharks have made it through every one of these, all the way up to modern day. They're survivors. They're really good at what they do. They are well designed to survive. They have survived through all of these eras and epochs and periods and have done a remarkable job of flourishing and, and expanding and doing whatever it is that sharks do. So why are they so good at what they do? Well, here's some biology. So let's, let's look. I did say that sharks are all cartilage. Uh, that's one of the defining characteristics. Five to seven gills on the side of the head and the pectoral fins are not fused to the head. If you look at fish, those pectoral fins are actually part of the head plate, whereas sharks, it's further back on the body. That's kind of the defining overall characteristics of sharks. And of course, what really defines sharks is the thing in their mouth. And that's the thing that happens to be the best preserved. We mostly know about sharks through their teeth. Whenever you go to Florida or places where lots of sharks' teeth are found, you can buy them in stores. Sharks will go through tens of thousands of teeth in their lifetime. Uh, they're constantly shedding and regrowing them. And they're the best part that tell you about the shark species and what they ate, because the teeth tell you what they ate. So here's a tooth. It's long and slender. Any idea what that might actually be good for? And by the way, has anybody been to the Cleveland Aquarium? That's a hint. This is a sand tiger shark with exactly that sort of tooth. It's a fish eater. Slippery fish go in, they can't get back out. These teeth are meant to hold slippery little fish in your mouth until you can gulp them whole. Um, these teeth are backward curving and the fish cannot slither out of the mouth once it goes in. Perfect tooth for that, that sort of thing. Here's another type of tooth and you'll notice this is from an extinct species. And you notice these little things here, they're called cusplets and they're not uncommon. You actually see hints of them on lots of shark teeth. When you look closely, a vast majority of them have cusplets. Some are triangular with serrations like state knives. That tells you a lot about what they ate. They ate sea mammals. Uh, this is examples from great white, megalodon, both feeding on sea mammals. Great for sawing and cutting. It's like steak. And in fact, here's our great white again with the money shot and the big mouth that uh, everybody loves to see. Unless you see it live in person, in which case you don't want to see that. Here's another really weird tooth. Uh, I just kind of threw it in because I like teeth. And this is a generalist tooth. This has kind of got a little bit of this. It's got lots of little small cusplets all in a row. And it actually is the type of shark that would be a generalist. It eats pretty much everything. Fish, other sharks, sea mammals, anything it can get in its mouth. And that would be the tiger shark. When you see a tiger shark on the reef, you're not gonna see lots of other sharks. They eat other sharks. And they are one of the sharks that is known to bite people pretty often. Uh, we're usually mistaken for sea mammals. They love monk seals in Hawaii. Uh, they like fish. This is the type of shark with a generalist tooth that you can see in his mouth there. And so when you see fossilized teeth, you can actually tell a lot about the shark, not just its size, but what did it eat? And I think sharks are survivors because of their senses. They have really well-attuned senses. How many people have heard about sharks smelling blood in the water? Pretty common, right? So yes, it's true. Their smell is phenomenal. Very sensitive noses. In fact, they've been called swimming noses. They can detect one part in 10 billion of blood in the water. Not people blood, it turns out. They actually like fish blood better. When you chum sharks, you're not gonna cut your finger. You're, you're gonna throw in fish guts and blood because that's really what they're smelling. That tastes good to them. And that's where they come from. But their olfactory senses are really well defined. A good portion of the brain and the snout is actually dedicated to smelling. And that's how they find their food, by smell. They just go up stream until they find the source of that interesting smell. There's a myth out there that sharks actually have poor vision, and that's not true for the vast majority of sharks. Uh, that blue shark with that big eye sees really well at the dark. In fact, most sharks have excellent vision, and most have much better vision than you and I do in low light conditions, uh, because that's when they're hunting. So a good time to not go swimming would be in the early morning or late evening hours. That's when sharks are out in the surf zone chasing fish. And their good vision makes it 
pretty good and easy to catch things at night. So sharks, sharks have excellent vision. And they're hearing. Now they don't hear like you and I do. They have ears, believe it or not, but it's buried inside their head. And in, like you and I, it's more for balance. They, uh, they have the same balance system you and I do. They have something that's much more unique to fish. How many people have heard of lateral lines and seen them on your goldfish in the aquarium? So the lateral line is that line that runs right down the side of almost every fish you see. Bony fish, sharks, everybody has them. And that senses vibrations in the water. And sharks really can sense vibration well. They can sense just a small movement from very far away, just from vibrating the water. And they sense that their whole body is the ear. So it's very, very sensitive. We can't really imagine what that's like to feel something coming at you, uh, but that's how sharks actually hear. And sharks have a sense that you and I know nothing about. We do not have it, but it is really cool. Electroreception. So there's a thing in sharks, in their noses usually, called the ampulla de Lorenzi, Lorenzini. And what those are are little tiny sacs in their nose that actually are tuned to electric currents. So sensitive, in fact, that they can detect your muscle movement and your heartbeat just from the electrical firing. It's like an EKG. They can tune in on your electrical activity of movement or just your heart beating or whatever's happening, breathing, all that muscle movement, they can tune in. And so if you ever look at sharks' noses, see those little freckles? It's not because they have bad acne. It's, it, these are actually the sensory organs. These are why the noses of sharks are very sensitive. Um, it's not for smell. They do have the nice nostrils there for taking in smell, which they're very tuned to. But their noses are sensitive because of this electroreception ability. And they use it to really good sense. This is how sharks actually can find things hidden under the sand that aren't visible. They're actually sensing the heartbeat of that crab or flounder under the sand. And then they'll just bite into the sand and pick the critter right out. You and I have no idea what that's like. That's just a sense we have no experience with. And this is actually one of the creatures that's really good at that. One of the speculations of why hammerhead sharks, which by the way, very cool shark. One of these days I'm gonna see one of these things in the water. Their head is like a big metal detector perhaps. One of the speculation is, is one of the hammerhead's favorite foods is flounder and crabs in sand. And they have a lot of those ampullae right along the snout. And that would be like really easy to scan over sand looking for something tasty. So maybe that's why they're shaped that way. A lot of speculation. Some think it's for hydrodynamics and lifting the head when they're swimming. Uh, a lot of speculation, but nevertheless, a very odd swimmer and a very cool swimmer. I think everybody's heard of whale sharks, largest fish in the world. Um, it's a shark, 30 to 40 foot usually, up to 45 foot. Perfectly harmless, they filter and eat plankton. As with most large animals, they're filter feeders, just like basking sharks are, the second largest shark. And you can see this diver again really has no fear of the shark. If the shark had teeth, maybe there would be a bit, bit of an issue there. But this shark is just there filtering the water. And uh, try not to get close to its mouth, though. You might get sucked in. So how many people have heard of this shark? This is a really cool shark. So it's a cookie cutter shark. Not that big. They're only like this big. Biologists knew about them. But the US Navy didn't for a long time until the 1970s. The reason is, is submarines in you know, the eternal warfare trying to be more silent. In the 1970s, they started putting rubber armor on nuclear submarines and attack submarines. Uh, it actually absorbs sound and sonar and makes you more invisible. And these subs would come back and there would be little circular divots taken out of the rubber. And they'd have to go into the shipyard and repair them and all that. And they couldn't figure out why were they losing these little circular pieces of their rubber armor coating on these subs. And until biologists were asked, they said, oh, that's a cookie cutter shark. So cookie cutter sharks have little mouths like this and they come up at night and they ambush and they take little circular chunks out of their prey at night. Two people have been attacked by a cookie cutter shark, long distance deep water swimmers, one in the Bahamas, one swimming between islands in the Hawaiian Islands. And they got bit and it was kind of bad. Take very big chunks out, uh, just like this poor fish here, this jack I think it is. But nevertheless, it's a really weird shark. It only comes out at night, only lives in very deep water, miles deep water. But uh, sharks come in all shapes and sizes, and some of them have really weird feeding habits. And of course, this is my favorite shark. Unfortunately, extinct. 
It's Megalodon, most impressive shark that's ever lived that we know of. Means big tooth. It lived about 28 million years ago up to maybe as late as one and a half million years ago. And this is one of the things I have about discovery is they keep trying to convince people that Megalodon's still out there to the point of faking photographs and things like that. Um, it is extinct. Ignore those pictures with the, the German submarine World War II with a giant fin swimming next to it. That was photoshopped. People found the real photo. There's no shark fin there. This shark was estimated between 50 and 60 foot long. And this one, unlike the whale shark, had teeth. And uh, that's actually how we know about this shark. This was a tropical species, did not like cold water, which may have been part of its demise. And here's a big sized one. Can you imagine the shark that goes with that thing? Here's the recreated jaws. Here's a great white shark. Here's a megalodon. Absolutely enormous shark. Really impressive shark. They think it was related to the great white, but that's actually in debate. It may actually be part of the, the mako or tiger shark family now, they're thinking. In any case, here's your average great white compared to a person, your average whale shark to a person. Here's a conservative megalodon, 50 foot. That's, that's the lower end of the range, 65 foot. Now that would have been impressive. I would have loved to dove with this thing in a really big cage. Um, but nevertheless, this guy was absolutely impressive. I, I really wish they had hung around so that we could see him. We know they're not around because nothing this big can go that long and not be seen or survive. Even in the deep ocean, it's got to eat big things. Well, we'd be fighting big things with big chunks taken out of them. And there's no new teeth. The, old, the youngest tooth they found is around one and a half, two million years old. So they're not around anymore. And they ate whales. Whales were their favorite tastiest thing. They know that because they've actually found whale bones with megalodon teeth embedded in them. And they tended to uh, hang around where whales at the time were. So wherever you find whale bones, you find megalodon teeth. And this is kind of an artist's conception of what that might have looked like. And that's probably why they're so big. They're going after big prey. So, you know, you're not going to be small and go after a whale, right? So that's why they got so big, probably. All right, so let's talk about shark attacks, because everybody likes to ask about shark attacks. So I'm an engineer. I have to show tabulated data. It's a rule. So just bear with me. It's actually very easy. There's no math involved. So here's the United States from the year 2001, 2013. Uh, this all comes out of the shark attack files that the University of Florida keeps on worldwide shark attacks and the United States too. So in the United States, for roughly 13 years, there were 40 attacks, which actually, <laughs> think about how many people, how many car accidents do you think there are in the United States every day? 40 is nothing over like a decade or more. And by the way, here's the real important column. Notice the number of attacks, which can be classified as a bump, a scrape, a bite, whatever. One fatality on average. I mean, the high year was three. Three people died in 2001 in the entire United States in an entire year of swimming in the ocean. Millions of people in the water every day. And there's three deaths in 2001. And on average, some years are zero on average one. I mean, that, that, that's really low. And so let's look at the world. Maybe it's better in the world, you know, worse. So again, actually, the United States is ahead of the curve. Worldwide, at a little bit narrow range, 2004, 2013, 69 reported attacks and only six deaths worldwide, on average, for this time span. Really small. This is like winning the lottery type odds. I mean, even getting attacked, which you're very likely to get attacked compared to die. Die is like, really, that's like winning the mega jack jackpot in the wrong way. So how, what are the real odds? What else can we compare shark attacks to? Well, everybody loves dogs, right? I love dogs. Dogs are a lot more dangerous. So 2001, 2010, roughly the same time frame. There were 365 deaths from dogs alone in the United States. Same time period, 11 shark deaths. I mean, dogs are actually the critter I'd be a little more worried about based on the statistics. Lightning. Lightning's a big killer. Almost 2,000 people from roughly 1960 to 2010. Same time period, 26 people in the United States died of shark attack. Not even closer, two orders of magnitude different. Riptide current, so go swimming in the ocean. That's more dangerous than being in the ocean with sharks. 361 deaths in the United States from 2004 to 2013, only eight deaths by shark. You're much more likely to drown. Um, being in the ocean is more dangerous. 
And oh, let's stay on a boat. It's safer to be on a boat, right? So just in Florida from 2002 to 2013, 782 boating deaths. In Florida, that same time frame, two shark deaths. So you kind of see where I'm going with this. Shark attacks are really rare, really rare. Winning the lottery rare. Death by shark attack, even more rare. Incredibly rare, order of magnitude less. And people get the feeling that shark attacks are increasing. I hear more about it now. I hear it more often. It's happening more often. You have to remember that early on, going in the ocean and swimming was not a po common activity. And population densities were less. Let's look at Florida. 1900, almost nobody lived in Florida. This blue curve here is the population of Florida all the way up through 2009. And you can see, wow, it really took off in the 1950s. Took off. Here's the number of shark attacks during the same time period. You see it pretty well mirrors the population. So it's maybe a little bit more here, but then again, surfing, windsurfing, boating has become a lot more common in the last 30, 40 years than it has been back in the, say, the 1940s and 50s. Not that many people in the water. So really, it's just kind of keeping up with the population of people that are in the water. And by the way, I'll point out these are shark attacks, not deaths. These little blue bumps down here, those are the deaths. Barely see them in the, in the graph. So yes, you are hearing about more shark attacks, but that's because there's more people and even more people in the water than ever before. So here's the real threat. We are the threat to sharks, not the other way around. We kill roughly, and it's hard to keep statistics because a lot of it is illegal fishing and deep ocean fishing that's not reported by a lot of countries like China. It's estimated we kill about 100 million sharks a year. So if I talk for an hour here, 11,400 sharks have died during the time I've been talking. That's six to eight percent of a top predator population. That's unsustainable. These are slow breeders. These things take 20, 30 years to reach sexual maturity. And then they don't produce that much offspring because again, top predators don't reproduce very fast or very often. They're not like rabbits and mice, which are at the low end of the food chain. So if we sustain six to 8% of the population, you're gonna see sharks starting to go extinct. And in fact, they may be swimming in the ocean right now and they're already extinct. A good example is the great white. The great white does not reach breeding size and age until they get about 10 or 15 foot in length. There aren't that many being seen anymore. If we just see five to eight footers, even though they're still swimming in the ocean, they're already extinct because they're not ever gonna to get to breed before they get killed. And you're gonna start seeing, I predict the next 20 years, sharks going extinct, species going extinct. Uh, they're already headed that way. And that's one of the reasons why we don't see sharks very often on dive trips and why people pay big money to, for guaranteed see, sighting of sharks. They're getting rarer and rarer and rarer. Uh, why are they going, why are they being fished? A lot of reasons, commercial fishing. There's actually a commercial fishery in the United States off the East Coast. How many people like crab cakes or fish sticks? Shark meat's a filler, it's a filler meat. They may have a little bit of fish in there and some crab in there, but the rest is shark filler meat because it's a white flaky flesh, just like the, the thing that they're in there for. Cat food, dog food, you know, seafood, medley, that's actually shark. A lot of the times it's shark. Sport fishing, mainly to go catch sharks. A lot of people out there try to catch sharks. And the biggest reason, shark finning. By far the worst thing we're doing to sharks. So what is shark finning? Well, people have heard about shark fin soup. It's a delicacy, it's an aphrodisiac, it's a big deal. When you ever have a major event like a wedding, you have to serve it in some parts of the world. And this is a typical shark finning operation. It's a roof, probably uh, somewhere in Asia, and look at all of those fins. Think of the number of sharks it took. This is just a couple days worth of fishing hundreds, maybe thousands of sharks that took to do that. Here's one beach somewhere probably in Asia, maybe in the Central America. On that beach, if you tried to count, I counted about 30, 40 of those sharks. It's a little hard to tell. But on this beach, in one spot in the world, in one day, there are more dead sharks than there will be dead people in the entire world for probably a decade from sharks. So who's really winning the war here? I mean, we're the ones that are kind of the, the killers. And we're not pretty killers either. So this is usually how sharks are finned. This is a hammerhead, a shark I would love to see in the water. Not like this. Typically, they pull them in alive. They chop the pectoral and dorsal fin off and just toss them right back in the water alive to die. They can't swim. They can't eat and feed. They're mortally wounded. And they 
helplessly fall to the bottom of the ocean and die. That's how we do shark finning. And that's really, really, really bad. So I hate to see that happen to sharks, but the world is turning around. Believe it or not, there's a lot of publicity about this now. A lot of banning of shark fin soup. Um, a lot of banning of importing and exporting sharks. Things are turning around now. It was really bad in the 90s and thousands. It's beginning to get better now. So I don't like ending on a bad note like that. So let's go back to my favorite shark, Megalodon. So remember I said that Megalodons like to eat things, and maybe you can kind of get a hand here. What did Megalodon like to eat? Whales. Whales. But really, you know, when you're a shark that size, you can eat anything you want. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and by the way, if you saw the movie with Dory, they named the shark Bruce because that's an homage to Bruce, the mechanical shark from Jaws. <laughs> that's where the name came from. Any questions? Yeah. You named a uh, uh, thing, those three that are responsible for the most attacks. Mm -hmm. Is there any particular reason why those three are the double digits? Probably because of what they eat in circumstances. Um, one of the big ones is bull sharks. So bull sharks are the only, one of the few, in fact, the only shark I can think of on the top of my head that can go in fresh water. They're estuary animals. They tend to live in brackish water. They can be full salt, they can be full fresh, and anything in between. Most sharks, like the great white, have to be in pure salt water. Brackish water will kill them. Uh, most sharks are like that. Bull sharks hang around land, and they're opportunist feeders. They're one of the ones that'll eat pretty much anything. Um, remember, how many people remember um, hearing about those attacks in New Jersey by a great white shark right after World War II in the 1940s, late 40s, and that was actually what Peter eventually based Jaws off of, was that shark attacks. And if you read all the accounts, a lot of the attacks happened up freshwater creeks, sometimes up 10 miles inland. They blame great whites. We now know it couldn't possibly have been a great white. They can't do freshwater. There is one shark that can, the bull shark. And so that they blame great whites because they caught a great white somewhere off the New Jersey shore, had like a human arm in it or something. So they blame great whites. Uh, and, you know, said they got used to eating human flesh after World War II or something like that. But the truth is, is that bull sharks are probably one of the more dangerous ones simply because they hang around where we swim. And they are generalist feeders. They will bite anything. Um, that's the way they investigate the world is let's take a bite and see what it tastes like. So bull sharks, I think, kind of fall in that category for that reason. Great whites are the other one, uh, another one of them. And great whites are kind of unfortunate. They, they like sea mammals in places where surfing is really common. Uh, almost all of the surfers in California know of someone or have heard stories about you know, surfers getting attacked by great whites. And it happens all the world. It happens in Australia, it happens other places. And the reason is, is because a surfer on a surfboard, they're ambush feeders, they're looking for a silhouette. And guess what a surfboard with four little fins sticking out looks like? A seal. And they just do what they know naturally. They go, oh boy, dinner. And they just come rocketing up from the bottom and hit that thing hard. Of course, when they get a mouthful of fiberglass and neoprene, pleh, oh, I've made a mistake. And it's bite and spit, it's called. Most shark attacks are one bite before they realize this is not a fish or a sea mammal, and they back off. It's rare for them to keep attacking, occasionally, but not often. And that's why great whites fall in the category. The final one was the tiger shark. You know, the tiger shark is, again, a generalist species. It's pure salt water. But like I said, when you see a, a tiger shark on the reef, you don't see many other sharks. They eat pretty much anything. They'll go after sea mammals. They'll go after fish. They'll go after other sharks. They're a generalist. Because of that, and because they are a shoreline species, they do actually do deep water travel uh, between places, but they mostly hunt in littoral shallow waters, reefs and places like that. And because of that, again, they have a lot of opportunity to bump into people. And again, swimming at night, close to shore, dawn and dusk, you know, that sort of thing is risky behavior with sharks, just because that's when they're out feeding and they're not gonna have, be able to see you as well. They're not gonna be able to pull off at the last minute and they realize it wasn't something tasty. So that's, I think, why tigers fall in the, the thing. The sharks you see in the aquariums, do they swim differently because they're in an aquarium than in the ocean? So they're always bumping into things. You ever look at sharks and they got those bloody noses? So sharks want to keep swimming in straight lines and they yeah. keep bumping in the acrylic. I feel really bad for them. Um, those sharks are in aquariums because, one, they have, they're mostly sand tigers. They do have some other species, like nurses, which take well to captivity. 
But every shark you see in the, in the aquariums are because they take well to captivity. And bonus with the sand tiger with those uh, gnarly teeth, they look ferocious. And people love seeing those gnarly teeth. Um, and since they could care less about divers and because they take well to captivity and they got those, that great set of teeth, um, aquariums, you see them in a lot of them. Um, and they're not too endangered either. Um, so you know, they can be collected right off the East Coast, in fact. Um, so that's why you see a lot of those sharks. Now, there are some sharks that they have never been able to keep in captivity. Tiger shark is one. You just can't do it. Uh, first of all, it'd be too tough to maintain the aquarium with a tiger shark in there and try to put divers in to clean the exhibit. Um, sand tigers, you can do that all day long. A real tiger shark, you probably would be a little more hesitant to do that. But the real reason is they, they are long distance swimmers. They don't do so well in square tanks. Um, they do have, for certain species of sharks, rings, swim rings, where they just swim in circles. Kind of boring, but you know, it'll keep them alive. Great whites, even that doesn't work. And they've tried to keep great whites in captivity. Um, the one that I'm remembering happened in the 90s. They caught one alive off of California, got it to SeaWorld or someplace that had a shark ring. Got him in there and he's swimming. Problem is, is at halfway around, he would turn and just bash into the wall. And then, you know, uh, get stunned, go around, do it again, bash into the wall. Just turn sharply, 90 degrees, right into the wall. Did that repeatedly and they, they realized he was hurting himself too bad, so they had to re-release him. Later analysis showed that what was behind that wall was the pump and filtration equipment, the pump, the motors. He was picking up the electrical signal from the motors and was just turning toward it because, oh, meal. Uh, and unfortunately, that just isn't going to work for the keep trying to. So some sharks cannot be kept in captivity. They're just too sensitive. They don't take well to tank life, um, things like that. Yeah. I don't know if you answered this question before I came, but I've always wanted to have someone comment. I have two grandchildren. Unfortunately, they couldn't come. Aww. One is royally enhanced with sharks and the other seahorses. Both cool. I promised I'd bring some back, something back on that. Okay. She asked me why there aren't any sharks in Lake Erie, and I said because Lake Erie is not salty. Now, does the salt of the ocean have something to do with their nose, with their ability to sense? Is it like a vitamin to them that we don't have uh, in our lake? So to live in salt requires special organs and special processing. Um, you know, fish, when they're immersed in, if you ever try to take a freshwater fish and put in salt, it'll die and vice versa. And the reason is, is they have um, different processing of the water. In fact, the whole hydrostatic pressure in their cells is different in salt water versus fresh water. I have not figured out. Yeah, it actually has a lot to do with the urinary system, um, cell stability. There's a lot, if you talk to the biologists, there's all things, uh, diffusion rates in and out of the cells are different and how the cell walls are set up is different. And I don't, I've never heard, how is it that bulls can do both? Bull sharks are the only shark in the world that can do fresh water um, that I know of. There is one other shark, by the way, it's called the Lake Nicaragua shark. Um, I don't know if people know where Lake Nicaragua is, but it, it's in Nicaragua. And uh, way, way back, it used to be connected to the ocean. And at some point it became isolated, it's now inland. And uh, the Lake Nicaragua shark was considered a separate species up until DNA testing. And they tested it and discovered, oh wait, it's really a subspecies of bull shark. Um, but bull sharks are the only one I know. The reason you don't find sharks in Lake Erie is because it's fresh water. Now another silly thing that Discovery Channel tried to do a few years ago was convince people that there's sharks in the Great Lakes. And they did it with fake footage in Lake Ontario where they claimed the shark came up the St. Lawrence River and was you know, filmed swimming off a pier uh, in Kingston, I think it was. <coughs> Again, <coughs> um, that, that just has never been recorded to have happened. Um, and they, they know the footage was faked. So we don't suspect in the near future, even in the near million year future, that sharks won't adapt. Never say never. Because They're very adaptable animals. Yeah, so that's 2,000 feet down. It will never see Lake Erie water. Uh, that's actually Silurian. <laughs> yeah, those, those are deeper earthquakes, but yeah. Um, you know, it would be really weird if the salt mines ever did flood with Lake, because I think all of Lake Erie would just disappear down those salt mines. Um, they're, they're huge, I don't know if you've seen the maps, but. Um, 
even without flooding salt into Lake Erie, um, we really don't have the fish life that sharks are after. And certainly anything that lives in Lake Erie can't live in salt water. So um, never say never though. I mean, the bull sharks somehow did it. They adapted to fresh water. So maybe other sharks can do it. And I don't know how it is that bull sharks can do both. That's really weird. I'd love to know more biologically about what's going on there. Because again, it's very hard to do. And this isn't just sharks, by the way. Almost all species don't do so well in either fresh water or salt water or brackish water. Some animals do really good in brackish water, where it's a mixture of salt and fresh. Um, a good example is Sydney and I were diving in the St. Lawrence River at the, the end of it near Labrador in Quebec. And uh, it's brackish there. It's a mixture of fresh and salt. It tastes salty, but there's not enough salt in it for a lot of the wood boring organisms. You'll see some crabs. You'll see some familiar sculpin and things that you would see in salt water. But at the same time, you don't see any of the other saltwater fish that you'd be used to um, because it's just too brackish. And it's, it's crustaceans, it's uh, wood boring Torito worms, it's all sorts of critters have problems being in either salt or fresh or something in between if they're not really good at that. Uh, there's strong biological imperative to be one or the other. Some can do a little bit of both, but that's rare. And so uh, um, it, it's, I, I don't know much about the biological mechanisms, but apparently it, it, it'll just kill them. So they don't do it. Yeah. Is there an enemy of the shark? Yes. The shark is afraid of it? So is there an enemy of the shark? Besides, Besides people, yes. Actually, there is. So remember that picture I showed you, that shark in South Africa leaping out of the water? That was about 10 years ago. They don't see sharks there anymore. A top predator showed up, in particular, orca whales. Um, they've had, just in the past couple years, over 10 great white sharks, like the one you just saw leaping out of the water, um, dead on the beach, with a huge chunk taken out of their side and their liver missing. Um, orcas love shark livers. And they see a pair of orcas, there's at least two orcas working together there, and all the great whites have disappeared. They don't get pictures like that anymore in South America, or South Africa, because two orcas moved in and they found a way to hunt the great whites, and the great whites are gone. Um, so yes, orca whales are definitely a predator. And sometimes the other predator of sharks is other sharks, like the tiger shark. Uh, if you're a small shark, tiger shark considers you a meal. So uh, yeah, they do have predators. Yeah. Are they allowed to go out into the ocean and take the sharks out like, anymore? Like there are some laws, you can't go for zoos, you can't go to like, Africa and pull the animals out anymore and put them in the zoos? Um, so there isn't a whole lot of shark protection out there. Uh, if you're in national waters, there might be national rules about what sharks you can take, which ones are protected. Um, and there are some based on you know, uh, how rare they are in the United States and other places in the world. The problem is the vast majority of the world's oceans are international, which means there are no rules at all. You can take anything you want and as much as you want. And this is actually a bigger problem. We're fishing our oceans out. It's been estimated we've taken out almost 90% of the fish from the ocean from 1900. 90% is gone. And, we, and you know this because of what they're serving in restaurants. Remember, have you ever been down to the Keys or Florida and you see those pictures on the wall from the 1950s of the people, the big grouper and the big jack, and then you look at the 70s, they're smaller, and the 80s, they're smaller, and now people are catching things that are like barely the, any size at all compared to the old ones? It's because we've overfished them. And they're not serving those animals anymore as commercial fisheries. They're just not sustainable. Now they're serving bottom fish. They've fished out all the midwater and topwater fish. Now they're doing bottom trawling. Um, how many people like Chilean sea bass? So it's actually called the Patagonian toothfish. It is a ugly looking fish. It lives in two to three mile deep water in the southern hemisphere. It takes 50 years to reach adulthood. Um, they may live up to several hundred years, and we are fishing them out in mass, and they remarket and rebrand them as Chilean sea bass. How is it economic to bring a fish up that's 50 years old from two or three mile deep water? Because that's all they've got left. They're going for the bottom fish, the last fish. Um, and that's another reason why I think shark attacks have increased a little bit. We're taking out all the fish. That's their food. And they're coming in close to shore trying to find anything they can to eat, and they're bumping into people. So that's another problem. Um, the, the whole, there are no limits thing applies to more than just sharks. It's a bigger problem. 
I know I ended on a depressing note there, didn't I? <laughs> Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. <laughs>